Okay, I guess I'm good to go. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the, my session. Uh, we're going to talk a lot of ESPA. And I'm Hassan Yasar. I'm a technical director and also faculty member at the Carnegie Mellon University. I have two jobs. One job is being a faculty member at the Carnegie Mellon University, is teaching a course in a graduate level on DevOps course since 2013. And also, I'm a technical director on the Software Engineering Institute. If anybody knows the CMMI old days, probably some of you, yeah. It was created from SCI, but it is, we are not supporting it anymore, so we are kind of dropped the ball. We said, get, get, let's get better out of it. Now, when I really started my journey at the Carnegie Mellon about 15 years ago, almost, and I really tried to bring about the engineering practices. I know SCI is known as engineering practices as FFRDC, which is Federal Fund Research Lab under uh, kind of OSD, Officer of, of Secretary of Defense under DOD, but we have under CMU as focusing more engineering practices. So I manage the group, does DevOps and DevSecOps agile practices and supporting many DOD programs as well as and supporting industry, which this morning with the DevSecOps days and Kate was one of my speaker, we have been supporting community on DevSecOps perspective as well. So let's talk about what it is, SBOM, and I really would like to get you guys think about what is the actionable stuff that we can do for SBOM. I know we heard a lot of SBOM. We know probably we know the SBOM, right? Anybody, I think everybody saw the SBOM file. Anybody have not seen SBOM file yet? Not yet? Okay, not shame, I'll show you a couple of exams, don't worry. <laughs> All right, so I really would like to talk about what is the actionable stuff on SBOM, what we can do. This is my kind of a legal SBOM, what you see here, what the legal says, put something as a legal disclaimer, who we are, what things we do, which is one, two, three, that's it, we are done. We verify it. All right, next step. I know, anybody knows what this picture about it? Any ideas? Which is yesterday's enterprise. I have a sticker, but I can give some bonus later on maybe. Anybody knows which city it is? It's Pittsburgh, yes, it's a Pittsburgh. It's about 100 years ago. Why I brought that topic is really things is evolving. You know, in yesterday's enterprise, kind of we still, Pittsburgh is known about the steel industry. It's not the Steelers, anybody a fan of Steelers? Probably yes, but it is known about the steel manufacturing. Now it got changed. So it's more about building supply chain with respect to the Steelers and everything else still and all this technology and stuff, but it got evolved. Now where we are today, we are more about the complex. Now comparing with the shiny Pittsburgh right here, got evolved, it's keep changing. And also as a parallel, we see a lot of complexity on the aircraft anywhere else. It's becoming a very, very, very complex problem, which we all already know about it. Either in industry, or using any type of technology. I would like you guys to remember this piece a lot because I'm gonna reference more into the, how the industry in, with respect to the manufacturing and in the like a construction business or electric business is changing, why the software is not as evolving as manufacturing in the certain components, right? And other things I would like to brought up this one, I know you all that know about the software is eating the world, but one thing is really I would like to highlight here, this sentence is really interesting because this actually came from an FAA as a notum. It says like, you really think about a software, now it is becoming a safety problem. Because if you don't really update your libraries, if you don't maintain your software, if you don't really follow the, what the software is designed, it's affecting our human life now which is very, very important. I thought we talked about like kind of more about the daily life. It's not a daily life anymore as we are using an application. It's affecting our life, which is one example. There are a lot of examples we can give how the software is affecting our human. It's gonna get even worse, I'll tell you. It's gonna get even difficult, even worse, how it's affecting our safety, our life. Now, a lot of things is basically in the healthcare industry, we are depend on it using a lot of softwares, and some of the doctors are doing the remote operations. You wanna be a patient that doctor will remote operation on you through the internet? I don't know. <laughs> I don't wanna be that bad, and it's scary. So let's move on 
actually, I prepped this slide about why is important to us, why matter to us. That numbers got outdated already within a week. <laughs> within a week, literally, now we have more percentage on the per commercial code and other things is keep increasing. So now it, the numbers keep increasing. These numbers I use based on the software supply chain report, everything else, it's keep increasing. Which is, we heard like to yesterday, the number got bigger, and I'm sure the next couple months it's gonna get even bigger. So now it's growing, right? It's really growing. We cannot really stop that things anymore. But what is important to me, I would like to get you guys in the next one is, why is that is matter? It's about the dollar associated, okay? So one is about the growing, but what is impacting to us? We know the safety is one problem. The second important one is about the business aspect of it. What does business mean? Like, what is the dollar we are spending at time? This is one of the example, actually true example I supported when the Log4j happened. I was supporting one of the organizations to tell and find out, are we really affected for Log4j? And I we spend like kind of a quick, this is not a big enterprise organization I'm talking about, a small organization somewhere in Pittsburgh, literally spent almost 900K to find out do we really have a log for j or not? This is really interesting, like there's a money associated now. Finding out do we really have a log for j, which is one element. Second one is, yes, we have log for j, but are we really compromised, which is the impact out of it, which is the typical financial risk can be a 5.7 million. It's like little things, how much is affecting to us as the financial perspective. That's another elements of the security with the SPAM, which is business association. Like there's a safety, and at the same time, there's a business dollar we have to spend, we have to be aware of it, which is your return of investment, such as one libraries. Think about the scale that we had here, about the percentage code base and the commercial code percentage. Think about the one log 4J. Now calculate your dependencies, how much money you are dealing about it. Either finding the problems, now I'm not talking about the solution yet, just finding the problem, are we affected or not? Do we have the right libraries or not? Second is fixing, which is the risk. That's the reason our finance people, our managers, they don't pay enough attention. Who are the manager in this group? Who are the finance person? Anybody as the director or VP? Who are responsible for the finance, right? That's kind of a mindset our business, they're literally looking for about the business and money perspective. That's your return of investments. Tell the people, this is a true story, how much money we are saving by spending time. They may say to you, why are we gonna buy the tools? Why are we gonna spend the time? Yeah, because you are saving the time at the end of the day about finding the problems. That's one element, that's cool, right? Another interesting thing I would like to highlight here now, adversaries are really attacking our software development environments. This is not the new, honestly. The paper was written as a story. I really would like to take a look later on. Trusting the trust is really inter in interesting. Like, yes, I'm a developer. How much I can trust on somebody else's code? Ask yourself, even though you're in the same organization, you are writing a code. If you don't know enough about somebody else's code, you don't want to trust. How are you going to trust the code? Can somebody tell me how are you going to trust the code? Even though your friend is writing the code, how are you going to trust the code? Anybody have an idea? Yeah. Security analysis is one element. What else? Requirements. Open up a little bit more. Architecture. Like, when you look at the somebody else code, even though sometimes I'm basically, basic, maybe I'm, f I'm kind of failing, look at my code if I wrote it six months ago. How can I trust my own code when I wrote it six months ago? I need to know about some information about the code. I have to have some notes in my code because how I write the code six months ago have a different mindset, different context, now I have different context. So it really trust is becoming a very, very important factor. Now, taking that concept put into the adversaries, now they are using a lot of trust relation to code at the writing, it's affecting our life. Well, it's becoming an impossible to detect any micro bug in the code. 
What's a micro bug means like the code does it's supposed to do, but at the same time, malicious people are inserting something into the code. Your code is really working what it's supposed to be, but there is some behind the scene, it's happening we don't know. Hard to check those configurations, very hard. So what are we gonna do now, right? That's the thing we are talking about, the software bill of materials. Let's move on to the next one. Another things I would like to highlight, one important factor is, we typically know our endpoint. Let's say we are looking for some of the components, but how much do we know other people are depend on other libraries? Like we are acquiring a software, maybe we are using a software, we are using a binaries, maybe libraries, but the library is built on somebody else's code. We are getting a compiled version of it. Let's say if you get in C++, you're getting a compiled version, there's a DLL in it, you see the binaries. You see the first hand, but you don't know what is really behind it, which is another complexity. Dependencies are playing a key role for us. We know what we know based on what we compile, but we don't know what is really behind it. What is really telling me as a story, this is basically college parties becoming, right? Now, this portion is getting very less. The code that we write, that we wrote, it's getting lesser and lesser and lesser. Because when I look at myself, my journey, when I started to write the code about 20 years ago, we were about to write a whole stack from up level. Now, with the frameworks, with the new technologies, with the new concept, we are writing very, very small code pieces. Statistically, when we look at the new way of writing the code, almost 15, 20% is actually the developer writing the code. More than 80% really comes from the framework. And I actually experimented with my students. I said, can somebody write me a hello world in the web page? They said, okay, five minutes. Here's the hello world of the web page. What they did, they used the multiple stack behind the scene using operating system, using the web server, using the framework, very easy to write the hello world, but dependencies are so deep, operating system level, web services, framework. Like the code is very one line of the code, but the dependence is really huge. That's becoming a college party, right? So what, how can we really fix that problem as it being another college party? It means that you invite the one person, suddenly 100 people are showing your house. Do you have a capacity to analyze everybody who is in or not? We don't, right? That's the problem that we are dealing. Let's move on. And other things that I would like to get into the more actionable, more reality pieces. Is SBOM is all about creating the file with the tools? Who says yes, no? No, we just created, creating a file, that's okay, we're gonna create it, but what is important pieces that makes actionable SBOM file? That's really key point. That's reality to make action because how are we gonna deal the problem at college party situation or dealing with other dependencies or other connectivities? It's really requiring think about beyond the creating of SPAM files. So what are we gonna do? What are we going to do now? Let's spend a little bit about the goal. What is our goal? And I would like to really think about for you guys for OASP top ten, which is new twenty twenty one. When you look at OASP top ten, here's our goal. Depend doesn't matter which organization you are in, our goal is really build up a secure design, develop and deploy into the secure infrastructure. That's what we are trying to do. With that perspective, I'm glad that finally OASP is listing insecure design as the one of the top 10 vulnerabilities here. What that really telling us? We have to think about security as part of our designing. We don't wanna be as reactive based on what we are finding, we have to be more proactive. How we can we be proactive? We're gonna think about the design element at the beginning. Another thing that's really interesting about the software data integrity, how are we gonna keep the integrity of the file that we are using? It's the same file that we are using in our build, deploy, and delivery. So think about that perspective, here's the relationship of your goals. And other things that we can talk about how pieces. Anybody heard about DevOps and DevSecOps? Some of you probably. So now here's my solution, which I have been teaching at the class and I have been supporting many DOD programs. This is kind of how you start thinking about DevOps and DevSecOps perspective. 
Honestly, DevSecOps is more about people start to ignore the sec pieces, so we start to call up other DevSecOps. If we are doing the right DevOps, we don't need DevSecOps, we don't do the right DevOps, now we are saying DevSecOps because we ignore the security. Why we ignore the security? Because we never addressed the design properly at the beginning. We never think about the early stage of security. Now DevOps is creating so much buggy code, so much problem, we said, hey, this is not gonna work out. Let's build up the security as part of our practices. So let's move on to a little bit on the DevSecOps spaces so we can connect the dot with the SPAM relationship with the DevSecOps because always we're asking what is actionable and how can I solve this problem, right? This is the question that we are trying to find a solution. And other things I would like to highlight here is a DevSecOps goal. There's a three main goals DevSecOps will like to achieve. One is the business mission. So that goes back to our analysis, how much money we would like to spend to fix any issues, how much value we are bringing to the user. So it's more about the business driven. If you really separate the SPAM or a secured outside of business, you're not able to achieve the goal of DevSecOps. It's based on the business, based on the value, based on the impact, which is the first elements. Because we don't want to be creating a software has no value. Think about your organization. The value is really how you're using an infrastructure that you may have in internally, or how you're supporting your clients. If there is no income, nobody's gonna support you. Reality, right, which is the business mission. Second one is goes back to the deliver of capable and delivering a value, which is related to your business mission and related to your value. So now, think about SPAM perspective. Every time when I say any word, think about what is it here for me as an SPAM thinking, right? Now you can put into the reasoning your product, then you can deliver as end of the product. So what the product means, basically we are creating a infrastructure, that infrastructure that makes you go from beginning to end, adding all the capabilities you can deliver the business value, business mission, based on your CI CD pipelines. That's connected that. What is the SEC and DevSecOps with SPAM together? Let me finish up everything here, we can talk about it now. So if you look at that perspective, this is a typical DevSecOps life cycle. As you can see, there are many places that we can create other dependencies, our SPAM files, like starting from test, build, code. Every phase technically generating some sort of a SPAM or a related dependencies we can capture. it. Here's your bumper sticker. SPAM should be integrated into the SDLC, which is software development life cycle should be your integration. If you look at the fact as creating the end to end, it's too late. What we should do, really think about from planning perspective. So I'm gonna show you an example of Kate, and she's talking a lot of the SPDX, how the cycling DX, we're gonna connect the dots. But really think about SDLC perspective, that's your actionable stuff. You may say, I'm not really building a software, maybe I'm a consumer. Still, you are practicing some of the deployments. Like, think about enterprise organization you are in. You may not maybe delivering or building a software, but using a lot of CM practices. CM is configuration management. Maybe using some other chef puppet for your deployments. Are you looking for dependencies of Chef Puppet? How they are creating the provisioning script? How you're getting dependencies and stuff? That goes back to your planning phases again. So you're kind of practicing older in your enterprise organization. Even though you're not building a software, you're practicing, you're not aware of it. But you are practicing already. So whatever you do in your organization, you have to think about every phase of life cycle. As I said, we can go over all of them, but Every base is creating a, some sort of infrastructure pieces for us. That's your go-to place. What is our purpose? Again, our purpose is really use those files how we created. Let's try to verify and validate and test it. How we creating the file, how we start at the beginning as creating one of the dependencies here in the code, we have to make sure that we are validating, which goes back to the, we're gonna trust the developer. We're gonna make sure that people aren't inserting any new files into the process, which happen a lot. As a developer, if I am stuck in one of the code that is not working, what I'm going to do? Grab a new version of it. I'm gonna get a new version, or maybe change something. 
without alerting anybody. How are we going to catch those alerts? We have to really verify through the life cycle to make sure that you are getting right libraries, right files, and you're verifying those components. All right, let's think about how can I start. Anybody any questions so far? Good? Okay, you can challenge me. If I'm wrong, tell me. If we are, tell me again. Let's, let's have more of a conversation. I really like that conversational stuff. If you don't ask me a question, I will ask a question to you. Right? Okay, let's move on. I know everybody heard about ESPA. I'm just going to go quickly. There are multiple words, like the format types that exist already, the Cyclone DX, SPDX. I'm assuming that you already know about it. If you haven't seen that, I'm going to show an example of what the file looks like. Okay? There's all that available. But the one thing is important. There are common software below elements that exist already. Another thing is important. Multilingual is machine-readable format. doesn't matter which one you're picking it. I favored SPDX, which new version is much better, but it's end of its mission readable. Don't really stuck on the one file. Make sure that put something into the, your infrastructure. Make sure that you're able to follow it based on DevSecOps practice. Let's look at closer what those files looks like, what the minimum elements looks like. Okay, I added a, another column here, which came from the actual I use the NTIA. These are the data field and description as a minimum elements of ESPA. How are we going to create those? How can we maintain those? You will see a lot of relationship in your software development lifecycle that say comes to creating those data elements. If you're talking about the supplier name, there you can really get issue tracking or version control systems or IAC, which is infrastructure as a code. You really keep track of those data elements, all that exist. If anybody's practicing DevOps, if anybody practicing modern deployment, they all have to have IAC script. They all have to have the deployment scripts. If you look at the deployment scripts, if you look at the infrastructure as a code, either Terraform or Vagrants or Ansible or Chef, there is already the name in it. The file name is already exist. So don't really challenge yourself. It is very difficult to create it. It's there already. It's already part of the script. We never able to think what is the SPAM creations. When we look at the component name, we can use issue tracking. When we look at the version, which is build and packaging, we can do. When we get into the more about the dependency relationship, we have a project. Every repository management, it's based on the project. If you go to the GitHub or GitLab, whatever repository management you're using, it, you're creating a project, each of the project should have a bill of materials as part of the project file together. Now we can see the dependencies each other. You download it, but keeping the SPAM is separate in your repository, we're going to solve the problem. So as you can see, all of the data elements has a representation in your software lifecycle. Again, you may say, I'm not using a software lifecycle. Still, you have a CM practice you follow in your organizations. You have repository management for your Ansible for your chef, for your puppet. It is already using some sort of a version control in an environment, keep track all the dependencies for you. Let's look at a different perspective, which is another one I like it, that came from NTA again. What are the minimum practices? So you finish up the data fields, which we discuss shortly. We're gonna talk about the different type of SPAM shortly, like what design, you know, source build, analyze the deploy in a runtime which I'm assuming that you build up your deployment. Now, how can I do and creating automation, which is a key point. Now, it goes back to the practice. How can I create those SBAM files using automation? How are we going to use automation? You have to use the continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, IAC. That's your solution. And I'm going to make a demo, by the way. I will show you how it's easy to use as pipeline create those files? Because one of the questions I have been asked many times, even though when I teach the class from developer perspective, they're saying, do I have to create all these files manually? Do I have to build up all the field manually? Oh my, do I have to learn all these things? No, you don't need to. This is the format to communicate each other. That's how we are communicating. That's how we are sharing information between suppliers, vendors, developers, and tools. But the key point is really use those automation to create that concept. 
every tool, either SPDX or Cyclone or SP, SWID, it is already available that you can use. You can generate those. If, you, if, you know, if there is no tools available for you as a developers, you can write it. This is not a kind of as typical things that it's going to be difficult to do that. It's just basic XML YAML file that you're going to create it. Format is exist. But we are making so scary to people not to use it. Don't do that. It's easy. I'm honest, I'm telling it's easy. Okay? So put your perception down, say, how can I do that? What can I do my job to make it easier? Let's move on. When we look at the practices here, that's really the tough part, honestly. Which we're gonna follow the policy governance education. Now that's a difficult part. Why is it difficult? You know what's an idea? People are really hard. Why? They don't want to change themselves. There's another reason, it's actually culture. Because why they don't want to change themselves? Because they don't want to be showing some power laws, or maybe some playing a power game, or they don't want to show some other things how they do. If you ask the developers, hey, can you show me how you do? Most of the developers, they don't want to share how they do. Why? Because they are kind of scaring to lose their job. That's the reality. You know, they don't want to share it. It's about the culture. Why? Because the managers are evaluating or incentivize the person different perspective. So what we can do now? Really build up a policy, we build up a governance. We have to promote engineer, we have to promote engineer, developer, or architects to follow the organizational postures and policy guidance. That's your difficult part. Let me give an example. I may know every dependency in my code. If somebody is using a code snippet from Stack Overflow, is the policy problem? Is it education? Or as from creations, what is that? It's a policy problem. Because developer wants to solve the solution, right? Right away, go to Stack Overflow, copy and paste the user in libraries. So we don't want to really block the developer, but somehow we have to make them enable, let them do their job. Now, as a manager, we have to find a way to solve that problem. That goes back to the really building up some governance pieces, building up some policy pieces, educate your developers. It is, it's a balance, honestly, Camden. I, I don't want to enforce, basically, everybody has to follow, but we have to give some freedom. People can follow based on certain guidelines and guardrails. So we can enforce in a policy, not penalizing the people, we can enforce the policy, improve our practices. That should be our perspective. So maybe you can say, hey, developers, like I heard some example, like we will like to lock down everything. It's a bad policy. Because if you lock down everything, developer has no right to do anything else. What they're gonna do, they will do some other things. Because there is a pressure from our finance people, they would like to get job done as quick as possible. Here's another note for all of you. I have been running DevSecOps survey for a couple of years. I asked the question for developers, what the secret the matter to you? Why you're not addressing the security? 99% of the developers are believing the security, but they don't have enough time to address the security. Why do you have enough time? Because the bosses or managers or the customer asking, get me that feature for me in a, in a short time frame I need yesterday. So now if you put the policy to block the developers, there's another pressure on the other hand, developer, they're gonna find a way to break the policies. So we have to find a balance. Other one is about education, is really a key point. All right, let's move on. This is another example to tell, show you, here's the comparison between SPDX, Cycle, and SWDC. It's kind of similar it is. And as I said, like version relationship is a key point to connect the dots in between. Again, this is one example to see as the, how, what the SPAM looks like. All right, so what we're gonna do as the continuation of the journey, we're gonna start from infrastructure perspective. Now forget everything else in a moment. When you are building your infrastructure, we have to make sure that the infrastructure is secure enough. One of the big problem I have been hearing as a vendor, they don't wanna share their SPAM files. Why? Because they don't trust you as an organization. How are we gonna protect their files? Because you technically, they are sharing with you as their secret in terms of their dependence, it looks like. So why is it important to protect the SPAM file that vendor is sharing with you? Why matters? There's an idea? That information is useful to your 
for what purpose I can use? It's made useful what you're, yeah. I said that information is useful for attackers because if they know what you're depending on, they, have, yeah. they know all the different avenues to exploit you. Great, thank you. If you look at like a pen tester, what is the first step of pen tester? There's some reconnaissance, reconnaissance, right? Sort of, <laughs> which they're gonna look at what the dependencies are. They're gonna find out how you build it. If they know your ingredients, they're gonna look at the CV's website, they're gonna get the vulnerabilities, attack your system. Now, if you're an organization, you have to protect your assets. You have to protect it. How are you gonna protect? You're gonna build up a secure infrastructures. So when you build up secure infrastructure, you're gonna build up everything in a single source code repository, which is important. I see so many people are creating multiple, multiple repositories. Do I need it? I should have a single repository so I can control it. Again, I'm a fan of us having a, creating a single repo, but creating a multiple repository is creating another attack vector for you. How you are creating the pipeline to build it, it depends on your language, but end of the day, code is a code. Doesn't matter where it is. If it's a single code repository, it's a source of truth, you have a full control of what's going on in this example. Then you can add other components like a build, documentation, integration. You can insert other type of practices as we discussed so far. Right? Now, what you're going to do is the next step, you build up your infrastructure and start to build up your dependencies in minimum three phases in your code developments you can do. You can do the build process. You can do the deployment process. Now, you can use continuous integration. You can build up infrastructure as a code easily can build up the three steps to achieve your minimum requirements. What was the minimum requirements? Get the minimum fields. Where you can do minimum fields, you can from get code developments, build and runtime. Like easily when you do the code commit into the GitHub repositories or any repositories, you can really do composition analysis at the moment, you can create a first SPAM right away in the code commit. When you try to build it, which is interesting, every automation build has the built manifestos. Either you're using a make files as the C++, or maybe creating a Gradle script, maybe you're creating a, a package in your NPM, maybe you're creating a jar file, all of them has built manifestos in it. What the built manifesto means, which is automations. If you look at automation script, then you can capture your build dependencies. When you try to deploy it, now you can capture your runtime dependencies. What is the runtime dependencies, which is your infrastructure script that you're deploying? Your Enisable has the runtime dependencies. Your Chef has the runtime dependencies. You all let the habit. So how are you gonna generate those files from your script that you can generate it? Let's, let's put all together in a policy with the deployment perspective. One, you had to put a policy into your acceptance, like acceptance means we're gonna put some policy to mandate engineer or developers, make sure that they are alerting the people or asking the permissions or following the policies, getting libraries. There's a legal element of applying the policies at the same time for a security perspective. We're gonna think about both, now SPDX3 has a legal Profiles, so we can keep track. Do we have a right to use those libraries? Can we make sure that we have right? Are we paying enough licensing? Which is a very, very big problem that we have to keep track of the licensing perspective. It goes back to the policy, should follow it. Now we can do basically some dependency analysis based on what you would like to do for composition analysis. Now jump into the CIC, the practices. You can integrate into the, your continuous integration. You can do the Compliance are the factory, can the deployment are the factory, which is the operational pieces of creating an ASPA. Are you good so far? Are you guys convinced? Is it easy or difficult? It looks like easy. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. But what I'm saying is all that exists available. All right? So what we can do overall as the quick summary, we can integrate our artifact catalog into our lifecycle and we can automate the script we can generate a spam file every steps, then we can monitor it. So everything what we can do, which basically creates some vetting process into our infrastructure, we can monitor it, we can verify it, we can validate it. It's simple, it's doable. If you really think about how I'm gonna create a spam, 
you're not following the right things. You can think about how can I spread it throughout the life cycle. Another thing is important with the secretive perspective, we always thinking as reactive, we're gonna change that. Why? Either you're gonna pay tax at the end of the, your delivery, which is kind of a month, a year later, or you're gonna pay the tax as you are building. Paying a tax or doing some of your duties as you are building is much easier versus doing at the end is much difficult because it's gonna cost you more money. That's what we would like to do as early integrations. So now I'm gonna show some quick actions in SBOM, which is a demo pieces. This is the example for you to see how it is easy to create it. And this is a basically one project and based on the Rust, I'm gonna show an example shortly, I'm gonna give a little bit background. The Rust code contains some vulnerabilities in it. Then what we're going to do, we're gonna process a build project, we're gonna execute the check of the code, we're gonna do some external libraries, this is the basic applications. And we have a pipeline, that pipeline does the static analysis, build the code, package it, generate SPAM, upload artifacts, scan SPAM to verify it, and then make sure that we are following the right things in SPAM perspective. Okay. And let me go to demo, and then we're gonna come back shortly again. Let's go to demo first. All right, let's go right here. All right, this is the one exemplar project. Oops. And using a GitLab runner, I'm gonna show you one example. Let's say again, this is just basically do to some lint check. And I'm gonna start the build right here. Go to pipelines. And it's using a GitLab, GitLab runner behind the scene. GitLab runner is created, I was failed, but we can start again, run pipeline. While it is working, I'm gonna show example as the done. Let's go back here. So does the lint check do some static analysis code pieces based on the code perspective? And creating a package, this is building, let's go open up each of them, components, it's already done, but we show you what is, how it is going behind the scene. Again, the Rust application, so to really build up the Rust, you need some packaging. So packaging tools comes from the cargo, which is I'm using a packaging tools. What they really tell me every application, that language that you may have, language you have to package it, or you have to compile. That's what the CI practice looks like. If you have an Angular JS, you have to package different, you have the libraries, either NPM package, other package, you're creating other dependencies, which is your build dependencies. That's what it does here about the build process and checking the code. Now let's look at other ones, what is working. I'm building, which is creating a cargo package. It's compiling the code, looking all the dependencies, bringing it together. And when we create that, we are removing any BAM file exists before because we are creating every time, which is kind of, we are creating as BAM file as every time as we build. Now we're not creating a BAM file as one time only. That means we already created every build steps. If you're creating a SBOM file, putting repositories, it's a one-time job, you're losing the point of the SBOM. That means you have to create dynamically. When you initiate any build process, you have to create BOM files based on your build, based on your deployment, that you have, you have kind of a dynamic creations. Otherwise, it's gonna become a static. If you become a static SPAM file, you'll be creating one time, storing a repository, it's all that absolute, because next time, something may change. You're losing that ability. Let's go back to the couple other examples. Let's go back one more time here. And building. And now it's the packaging pieces. That's how we are creating a package. Right. Which is, now right now I have the packages created and give you an example as Output as the Rust, Rust is basic hello world type of applications and creating a package is deployable which is creating a container version of it. Every time you can create the artifacts as well as the result of the artifacts. Let's go to the next one which is about the SPAM generators. Now as I said the package is really generating SPAM file to you, it's the BAM file. And then when we create a download the BAM file you will see the generation of the BAM file as part of your libraries. Now it's basically specific language that I created as the Rust and using a cargo app as behind the scene. 
So what you should really ask yourself, what is my language pa package I'm using it? What are the containers? What are the package mechanism looks like? And try to integrate S bound file generation as part of your build packages. So it's not done yet because we said we would like to verify it. We would like to validate it. For the another thing, once we validate verified, we have to look at any vulnerabilities in the S bound files. Because we know the version, we know the files, we have to check out any vulnerabilities in the file perspective. Which goes back to the bomber scan. Bomber scan is gonna look at the any type of bill of metal you created, you can look at any vulnerabilities in that files. Here's the vulnerabilities, I may see that. There you go. Based on the version that you may have, you can look at the vulnerabilities. Now it's becoming more actionable. That will tell you, here's my library that I'm using it, here's known CVEs in that files. So tools all that available, what we did, we basically integrated the tool into our pipeline. Generate it, look at the content, look at the file, look at the CVEs, there you go. Now we can fix the vulnerabilities that you know. And other things like fixing vulnerabilities, it's also requiring all this process again. You think that I'm gonna update every file quickly, everything's gonna work out? It depends, it depends on your testing, it depends on your architecture, it depends on how things you are building. So now I know it, now I can go fix it, I'm gonna run the same pipeline again to make sure that I'm able to test the functionalities, I'm able to deliver the value for my business. Okay. Let's look at another one. So I'm storing everything into the other factories that I created into the other factory puzzle that has to stay in the location that I create as a binaries, or the artifact that I create has to store in the same repositories. Now, looking for dependency analysis, if you look at some dependency analysis, I can store those files and look at for any dependency in each other's based on the projects. And other things, otherwise you have to keep those artifacts with your code together. Because your code is your project, has dependencies as project together, because you may not have different files in somewhere else in sitting that you don't have version conflict because you may have a different versions, different project, you have to keep them in a single repository so you can really maintain those files which are project specific. And last one is about the verification phases. Now I'm basically verifying with my BAM files which is in total, which is a kind of a open source tools for attest attestation and creating the content of the file, you're gonna make sure that you're using the files as the right component you're pulling out of it, which is verification pieces. Okay, and this is the basic example to show you how it is easy done with the CICD perspective. Questions? Great. So basically, Intoto is running behind the scene as a GitLab runner job, getting the BAM file and sending to the uh, Intoto containers and comparing the content of the BAM file based on the, the libraries and versions. It is basically running the containers. I can show the kind of uh, configurations shortly here. Let's go back to the, our uh, pipelines and, and look at the job. Actually, let me go to the project information. There you go about the files. <coughs> Here's our GitLab runner. I can share the content, basically running a container version of Intoto and comparing the files easily, which is a kind of a GitLab runner part of it and running a container each of the components. Okay. All right, so as you can see, like, we can really create all those dependencies and compare it and make sure that we are able to succeed it. This is specifically for uh, one example of creating an SPAM file, analyzing the content, look at the vulnerabilities. Okay. Let's look at, back to our slides. In our slide, what we did is basically, there are multiple stages in the pipeline using a cargo clip. You can take the picture or I can share the slide later on. We did a cargo build, we did a cargo publish, and creating a container version of it. Now once we have created, now we can really, the SPAM generation pieces using as the package content itself, creating a cyclin DX as an example. I'm gonna show the output of the BAM files. It's an XML. 
but you can use SPDX or you can use any type of tools converting each others. Then we pushed artifact into the catalog so we can look at later on. We verified with Intoto and then we did the scanning of the libraries. So it became more actionable for us. Couple things is dynamic creations. Look in the content. We are creating every time when we change. Now, if any developer is putting a new version of the components or changing the package, we'll grab right away the changes. That's becoming more actionable, right? So, an overall, this is the link check. I'm going to go quick because we don't have time. Here is the example of the BOM XML file and the cargo references, descriptions, and stuff. Here's the bumper, bumper scanning tools output because we don't have enough time. But quickly, what is next? This is important pieces that I would like to talk about it is how we can really get together, how we can solve this problem. Think about what you're eating it as the kind of a little burger. Think about everything as document ingredients. So now typically, when we build it, we have to think about the planning perspective, goes back to the design. Now we kind of didn't show anything about the how the design is done, but we have to think about in design perspective. Map all apps to the code bases. Think about what you have in your organization. Look at all your code bases and keep track of those documentation in your code and enforce the policy on CI CD, which is the enforcement policy, which is a gatekeeper you can do. You can put your build process as your gatekeeper. You can put your deploying pro process as capturing the runtime files that you can think about what your eating is in between. As a takeaway, what you should do, uh, there are type of the SPAM file that we discussed so far. You can create the design phases of SPAM. You can really source it in development phases. You can create the SPAM in the build phase. But all of this file doesn't mean they are not talking to each other. You're creating, but you're creating every phases of life cycle that you do. And you're gonna connect the dots. It's really important you have to connect the dot, which is automation is key point. Integration is another point you have to integrate it because otherwise you cannot have traceabilities. Creating a bunch of files sitting in repositories, it is useless. I'll tell you, it's useless. It's good to have it, but if you don't use it for your monitoring, for your building, for your deploying, there is no benefits. Why? Because it goes back to log4j analysis. How much time I'm spending to know is one element, Second element is how much able to, I'm able to go fix quickly and timely to eliminate any zero-day vulnerabilities. It is requiring automations. It is requiring integration. It is requiring a building at the beginning. Another thing which is my dream, really I would like to put, uh, put into the sacred stories. Anybody know what the sacred stories means? If anybody is writing a story for a functionalities, for a planning perspective, we have to write the secret stories. There's a functional, like an agile term, we write the stories about the case and epics and stories. We have to think about the secret stories. We have to think about what are the secret requirements that require for functionalities. We can really integrate SPAM right away into our secret stories. As soon as if anybody's writing some SQL statements or using some other dependencies, maybe libraries, that we can really track at the beginning of the planning perspective. Like one example, if anybody is gonna tell me we're gonna build up an application using a basically kind of like a AngularJS, we can generate dependencies right away based on AngularJS. That's what I'm talking about, the secure stories. So overall, really use the automation pieces, integrate as much as you can. That's your job. Okay. Just running quickly, there is our the website. You can get a lot of information about DevOps and DevSecOps. I have been writing a lot of blog posts and webinars and supporting many organizations. Feel free. You can download, you can take a look, you can use any times. End of the day, it's about the code, okay? <laughs> Don't forget that. Everything is code. We are going that direction. To deal about the complexity, it's about the code. Whatever you do, it's a code, end of the day. S1 is a code. We're going to use the code, analyze the code again. What are you going to do? Automation and coding perspective. That's all what I have, and I think we discussed a lot, but if you have any questions, please reach out to me anytime. I'm happy to really share your stories or hear about your problems, as maybe you have any use cases. I'm happy to talk in my students in my class every time. Right? Thanks for joining, and I'm here for any question that you may have. It. I hope it was actionable to you. Ask yourself, what does it for me here? How can I use it in my actions?
When you go to the office on Monday, please remember, what is it for me? What I'm going to use it? If you're struggling, send me emails. I'm happy to answer your questions. All right, thank you again. Thanks for joining my session. Thank you.